Good evening. <laughs> My name is Bob Sylvester, Director of Education and Programs here at the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. And on behalf of AMOCA's staff and Board of Trustees, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 8th Annual Stephen Fleischman Lectureship featuring Nick Cabe and Bob Faust. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of the Ho-Chunk people on whose ancestral land Madison was built and recognize the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Tonight's lecture is being recorded, so be sh please refrain from any photography and remember to silence your cell phones. Though, while you are checking the volume levels, feel free to quickly open up your favorite social media app and follow the museum at Amoka Madison to learn more about the upcoming talks and programs. <clears throat> uh, upcoming highlights include a fashion show next weekend with garments inspired by Federico Uribe's exhibition Metamorphosis, currently on display in the State Street Gallery. Also on the calendar is Gallery Night, the Ballet Arts Crawl throughout Madison on May 3rd, and the opening reception for William Villalongo, Myths and Migrations, on Saturday, May 4th. Tonight's presentation is made possible by the Stephen Fleischman Distinguished Lecture Fund, an endowment established in honor of the 25th anniversary of Fleischman's tenure as Momoka's director, provides for an annual lecture by individuals who have made an exceptional contributions to art and culture. Stephen Fleischman nurtured and expanded the cultural and artistic life of Madison for nearly three decades. During his tenure, Fleischman oversaw tremendous growth through all aspects of the organization, under his steady hand, Amoka held exceptional exhibitions of regional, national, of international scope, increased creative community partnerships and programming, strengthened the museum's permanent collection, and established the Amoka Foundation to grow the endowment and secure the financial health of the museum. Under his leadership, the organism changed its names from the Madison Art Center to the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art to better reflect its mission, and he oversaw the expansion of the museum into the current Cesar Pelli Design Building we are in now. Sadly, Steve passed away in January, though his impact on Madison and its arts community lives on. We are very fortunate to continue Steve's legacy of building an arts community with tonight's talk by our distinguished guests, Nick Cave and Bob Faust, speaking about their multidisciplinary creative space facility. The complex is home to a range of enterprises and is a creative hub for artists, artisans, designers, and architects. Located in Chicago, the space hosts myriad pop-up special projects, such as exhibitions, performances, and educational opportunities. However, facility is more than a place. Facility is a philosophy and an agent for community action. From providing scholarships to emerging artists, partnerships with like-minded artists, and collaborations with institutions to galvanize their outreach programming, the space serves as a nexus for creativity and community. Facility is imbued with the belief that art and design can, change, can create peace, build power, and hopefully change the world. Nick Cave is an artist, educator, and foremost, a messenger, working between the visual and performing arts through a wide range of mediums, including sculpture, installation, video, sound, and performance. Cave is best known for his sound suits, colorful wearable sculptural forms based on the scale of his body, initially created in direct response to the police beating of Rodney King in 1991. Cave's work is featured at many museums and institutions, and he has participated in numerous solo exhibitions and shows at galleries and museums throughout the United States and internationally. His first museum retrospective, Nick Cave for Othermore, opened in 2022 at the MCA in Chicago and later traveled to the Guggenheim Museum in New York. Bob Faust is a principal and creative director for Faust, a cultural branding and communication studio in Chicago. His collaborative and non-secular approach to his work results in functionally expressive visual experiences that inspire change and instigate tangible actions. An artist in his own right, Faust is also the studio and special projects director for Nick Cave, where he both collaborates on exhibition design and produces Cave's performance works. Guiding this evening's conversation is Faisal Abdullah, a British-born, Wisconsin-based artist and barber who is a professor of printmaking and associate dean for the arts in the School of Education at UW-Madison, and in 2021 was named the Chazen Family Distinguished Chair of Art at UW-Madison. As an artist, he is primarily a printmaker and photographer whose work explores the intersection of black identity and placemaking, with recent series inspired by black barber shops and black Freemasons. His exhibition, Dark Matter, was on display at Amoka in 2022. Please join me in welcoming Nick Cabe, Bob Faust, and Faisal Abdullah to the stage.
Thank you. Is this on? Oh, yeah. Well, good afternoon, good evening. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And for me, I, I want to just jump straight in um, because we've got a lot of stuff that we want to kind of discuss. Now, I think for me, I'd like to preface maybe a question with you know, my own kind of um, journey. And I do recall when I was a young person going into the National Portrait Gallery and seeing images of my own body in subservient positions and then writing myself a promissory note that I would become an artist to try and move the needle ever so slowly. So I'm curious at both of how you got there. Where do we start? We're going to start in the middle. We're going to start in the middle. Why me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think it was um, when I was uh, maybe 16. But I, you know, I, I think I've always been an artist, but it was when I was 16 and I was at the St. Louis Art Museum. And I saw my first Kiefer painting and I literally started crying and I didn't know why. So it was really that moment when I knew that art had the ability to affect and, and, and to move me. Um, so I think that that was just a sort of a moment of sort of realizing that uh, that that was possible. Now you know I'm growing up with one of six boys, so it, you know I'm also sort of you know you know at that age I'm not I mean. My oldest brother, Jack, is an artist, too. So, you know, I've always been a maker since I was very, very young. And so, and then I come from really uh, sort of infrastructure of, of craft and, and makers. Uh, and so, you know, this is really sort of just a natural thing for me to sort of continue to pursue this as a career. What yeah. about you, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, th I think for me it just was always the thing I needed to do. Uh, I think that in school, when you went to art class or had art the section of your day, that's where I felt the most free, the most excited, the most safe. I mean, I hear that from many of my art friends. But I think the story that I'd rather, uh, or that I'd like to share is more that my parents gave me free reign of my room. That's the only place I could do whatever I wanted to do. But I could do whatever I wanted to do there. And so I spent tons of time up there and like they would play cards on the weekends Fridays and Saturday nights and people would come over at six and they'd leave at one so I busied myself in my room and at the end of the night they'd come up and it would be a new color or everything would be changed or my brother's <laughs> furniture would be in my fr in my room and his would be in his so it was just like that's how I love to spend time I just loved um, change I loved um, how change made you feel I loved the surprise on my parents' faces when they would be like frustrated but also happy. You know, all of that stuff to make people feel it was fun. And, you know, color, shape, form, all of those things are super exciting. Great. Um, what I'm really fascinated by, <coughs> Nick, is how you describe yourself. And the order of messenger, I'm going to get this right. Uh, messenger, artist and then educator, correct? So could you expand a little on that? And then I'm coming to you as well, Bob, to With hear that? yours. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting uh, because I think everything that I do is not, f it's, it's for others. And so it's interesting when I sort of, you know, I'm working in the studio and, and I mean, it's amazing to think that once I complete a body of work, it never returns back to the studio, ever. So that's just sort of like, but you know, it's not, and I'm not attached to any of it. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, I, I think I'm an artist with the conscious, an artist with the civic responsibility. So for me, it is the medium for, for change for me. Uh, uh, and, and, and it's, a, 
you know, I want to use art as this vehicle for change. And so, you know, so that's where the messenger, messenger comes in. Uh, and in order for that to happen, I have to be an artist. So that's sort of uh, how I identify. And, uh, and then education, you know, I love teaching. Um, but, you know, I'm teaching not only at SAIC, but I'm teaching in collaborations sure. uh, on, you know, um, when I'm sort of installing a show and I'm sort of connecting with, you know, young artists that are sort of installers and practitioners there and, you know, oh, what are you doing looking at their work? And so, you know, we're like chatting instead of installing my show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's true. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing. And it's in that order because of, of you know, it's, it's, you know, I'm here to, to do that. Thank you. And Bob, how do you feel in terms of your own pathway? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, as I get older, the thing that I think about the most is like, um, how can I be the most effective person? Um, and... I definitely have always thought that like art and design are our greatest tools um, for change for in all ways. And so um, I'm just diving deep into those two things, art and design, using them every way I can to um, pry open things, make wedges. I feel especially grateful to be next to him all the time because with his platform to be able to be that amplification for all of that, also feels like a giant way to be effective. So um, all of those things are the, you know, why I'm doing what I'm doing. And for me, that's a really beautiful segue because I want to, before we get to facility, is talk about how this collaboration side, both of you together. And I recall you saying, um, Nick was about feeling and you were about strategy. Who so. said that? Well, I think you said it. Oh, I may have said that. <laughs> but I'm curious to know how that collaboration started and what both of you bring uh, to the mix. Okay, so the story starts a long time ago. Um, a mutual friend of ours um, invited me to a sale at Nick's apartment. How long ago? Maybe 20 years, 25 years ago? 30. 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> Okay, so 30 years ago, he was an artist, but he wasn't the artist he is today. And so he was selling sweaters to make rent. That's the bottom line, right? Really? It was a, it was a sweater sale to make some rent. So the sweaters were really expensive. They were also a little kooky and crazy. And I walked into this apartment and <coughs> knew I had to leave with a sweater. Um, and was just kind of like, oh, how do I get out of here with like not spending too much money? I was only like 25 years old. I didn't have much to spend. And they were long, like a sleeve might be like way down here. And, or there might be two or three holes in the neck. And you're just like, ah, I like the gap, dude, you know. <laughs> so it was stuff like that. And so he can tell that I was sweating it a little bit. And I found one brown sweater with one long arm and I'm like I'm taking that one <laughs> and he said why don't you go into the back and try it on so I'm like I go into the office and I tr try on the sweater and here he comes with a stack of sweaters and now we're not in the room with all these other people and it was an opportunity to chat a little bit and um, that's when the conversation started and I learned that he had his first big solo show coming up and he's like, I really need, um, or I get to make my first book for this solo show. And I said, well, I'm a designer and I live around the corner. Why don't you come you know, tomorrow and see what I do and if there's a match, maybe we can trade. Um, <laughs> it, I definitely came out on top in that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's where it started. And we made, we made a book and it was, the most important part about the story is he, worked with me to make a book, but the prompt, if you could imagine a designer getting a prompt that was this open, all it was was, I need a book, but I want an object. And I was like, that's the coolest prompt I've ever heard. So we always have been making projects since then with that same idea of being really open. Okay, fantastic. So for me, I kind of consider 
the two of you at this kind of intersection where the pathways that have made you establish facility, you know, personal stories that fed into it, your uh, respective disciplines, artist, designer, artist, sculptor, and performance. So can you just maybe just give us the overview as to, I would say, how facility came into existence? Well, you know, I, you know, you know, as a, as a young artist, you're in a studio, and you know, as, as the career starts to take off, you're like, you take another sort of space in the building, then you take a third space, and then you're making work that we can't make it on the top floor because we can't get it down to the <laughs> first Hello. floor. I mean, so this is what was going on for like uh, 10 years, and I was like, I have got to get out of here. Um, and then I was just sort of looking for property. Mm -hmm. uh, but it had to be live work. Uh, I mean, that's the only way it can be. I can't imagine like a studio somewhere else and living somewhere else, because I would never be home. But, um, <laughs> and so it, it took probably three or four years before I'd found the right building. And I don't know why I was up in uh, uh, Old Irving Park, it's the neighborhood, uh, I don't know why I was there, but I was. And so I was driving down the street and saw this building. He was out of town. And I, and you know, this is after looking at like, you know, 20 buildings, you know, and, and you know, there was a, some close calls on a few, but you know, the zoning had to be changed. And so it was, it's a lot of things that sort of came into play. But you know, I saw this building. I liked what it looked like on the outside because on the outside it look, looks like three storefronts, uh, mom and pop sort of spaces. But as I walked in, the building it was wide open. I mean, like amazing. It's it's really amazing. And so, uh, and then it had this second floor that was just incredible. And so then I just called him and said, I think I found the building. He's like, oh, yeah, right. Because, um, <laughs> you know, he was like, oh, my God, you in the building. And so, uh, <laughs> and so that's, you know, I walked into this building and I knew that it was right. I could feel it. And, uh, and it just made sense in terms of needing the whole production on one level. Uh, you know, from production to, you know, photography uh, facility and uh, sort of packing and shipping, it just all made sense. And, and then there was the second floor, which was really a great sort of living sort of space. Um, and then we had, um, you know, the parking lot in the back I knew I could turn into green space. So it was a lot of things that were like really important. And I knew that we could open up the space um, in a number of ways. But I think the most important thing, it was these three storefronts in front of the building and, and how that could be, how that could function and operate for us. Yeah, so if you, if you, if you can imagine, like there's three mom and pop storefronts in the front, but what's so great about them um, is they're directly across the street from a public high school. Um, and so we're using those three glass storefronts in a vitrine-like gallery space, not unlike what you have um, that the shop used to be out front. Mm -hmm. um, but what we're putting in there is artists' work that, um, they're young artists that are doing great work, but they're not necessarily in the track that's gonna land them in a museum, at least not in the next couple of years, right? And so what I've noticed, and he alluded to this, is when we're at a museum installing a show and you're working with the preparators for you know, that week of installation, they're all artists in their own right, almost in, always. That's almost always the case. And almost always, they're not in the track that's the traditional gallery track. And he's always in a back corner on phones scrolling through asking to see what's your work. I'd like to see what that work is. And he's, you know, off the, you know, off the cuff kind of mentoring these young people, 
And this was an opportunity for us to invite them for an opportunity in the front. And um, it's all kinds of work. Sometimes it is art on a wall, just you know, a painting on a wall. But oftentimes, it's something that a, high, a public high school student wouldn't consider art. So when they see a room full of stuff that doesn't really make sense for them to sit at the bus stop and see that there's a label and it has a name and something's being celebrated like that, really starts to open things up without anybody having to tell them, right? And so if that happens day after day after day, I feel like that's the building's greatest job. So I guess my, my next question is, is almost about content and how things, how the building functions and serves the community. And firstly, how do you build trust um, with the community? When we think about the number of art spaces or artist-led spaces that are happening throughout the world, even in the UK with Yinka Shonibari, we got Project Row House and, and the facilities, how do you build trust with the community and the arts community? The first thing you do is you don't say, here, here we are, come look at us. You introduce yourself and let them introduce themselves to you. And so I don't know if the photo showed up, but it will show up. You'll see one that says, love thy neighbor. Um, that's how we moved in. The whole first year was about this project. And every school within a two mile radius, um, the art um, teachers were spoken to and they were given these little cards and we asked people to um, let us know who they are. And they could write their name, they could draw a picture, they could do whatever they want. Um, but this is what we were doing and we put their work into our space so that they can see them as the very first thing that was there. Um, and you didn't have to be an artist to do it, right? You can just literally put your name on the, on the circle. But some people made these really wonderful cards too. Um, yeah. So we tried, to, we tried to enter in a really soft way. No, and I think that that was really sort of, you know, I was thinking, you know, as we were sort of moving in the building, it was like, you know, you think about like, oh, you know, should we, you know, make a pie, make pies and bring them to all the neighbors? <laughs> and I was like, no, we're not going to do that. It's a lot um, of pie. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're just sort of thinking about like, you know, that simple sort of gesture that sort of uh, can sort of, uh, that, can really go a long way. Mm -hmm. And to know that, you know, the, the public schools as well as the um, businesses, local businesses in the area were all part of that project. And for them to be able to, you know, come and sort of view that sure. was like sort of really amazing. And then what it looked like was mm -hmm. really quite, quite beautiful. Uh, and so, you know, it's those sort of moments where, you know, there's all sorts of ways in which you can welp welcome uh, yourself in, into a community. And the other thing is when we do an <laughs> opening, like mostly the work in the front window you view at any time just by walking by. But when there, we, we do do a reception for the first night of any project and we do that on the sidewalk. And so you don't even have to come in the space. Like we bring a cart full of like waters and juices and we just stand outside for four hours and we have our reception on the sidewalk, like, like a block party would, but you know, yeah. simpler. One of the things I'm really curious about is, in, in making work, is proximity. And the fact that the audience is always placed as the voyeur. So I'm standing on the sidewalk in Chicago, and I'm looking in to a space of wonder. But I'm grounded in the environment. I'm grounded in the smell, the sound the pavement or the sidewalk and I can't touch it <clears throat> and can you just talk a bit about the kind of intention and purpose behind creating this space that one is always kind of looking in but and is always changing you know I think you know we do uh, I would say three sort of projects a year uh, but you know the sort of interesting thing about uh, you know the storefront galleries is uh, we want that sort of space of wonder. We want there to be that sort of separation be and we want that pause. Uh, because I think it's another way of being within your body. 
but how do I gaze and really uh, take in what I'm sort of viewing? And so that was, you know, that's important to us. But uh, what's also important is the mystery behind that wall, that storefront. No one knows that that is the sort of making space. That is where everything happens. And so it's it's that sort of sort of uh, feeling as well, and the privacy of that. You know, we want to be able to give uh, this uh, image, this sort of cultural sort of uh, expression to the community, um, and so it, it becomes a buffer. It becomes. Uh, yeah, all of those things. But also like working primarily in museum spaces all the time. We, you know that that's a big white box, that's a privileged space. And we know the problem that every museum has of getting people to feel welcome. And I feel like this project space is one of those, one of those first steps into knowing that art's for everybody, right? Because you are standing in your own community. You're, you're on your block for that, you know, in, for that kind of purpose. And so I do think it's uh, a nice entree and not these like opening days like I just described. If you're walking your dog past, to be able to have that first conversation and ask a funny question that I would be afraid to ask if I was in a museum and I walked up some big stairs through some big doors, but I had this first question, that's another breakdown, right? That's mm -hmm. another wall broken down or at least a start, a crack. And I think all those things really matter. And, um, you know, we're talking a lot about these spaces, but we also try to bring projects into the community. So you see some of those up there too. Um, but they're all outside museum wall spaces. They're, you know, on Michigan Avenue or on the CTA subway going from the south side to the west side or in Brooklyn or, you know, almost guerrilla style, you know. Yeah. I think one of the things I'm curious about is, is your practice as a topographer and knowing that when the community is allowed to engage in the work, there's the presence of the hand. And then on the previous piece that we saw, which is the computer generated text, yeah. there was a kind of choreography to that text with its movement and also the movement of the traffic. And I think they're very, very different experiences. So could you speak a little bit about the importance of the hand? I'm kind of curious about that when you're working with the community. The importance of the hand. Um, well, in, in, in that case, like, those projects are what we call these immediate projects, actually. So each of those spaces is also um, video mapped, so the entire back wall can become a billboard overnight. Um, and because we know that space and have that space, we can react very quickly. We don't have to go through um, any amount of um, red tape or bureaucracy to get a project done. So when there's a reason to say something, we can actually have a dinner conversation and oftentimes it's led by him. He's like, oh my God, we have to do something immediately. And so dinner comes up with the idea and dessert is back on the computer downstairs that's not answering your hand question, <laughs> but it is answering like how fast you can do something what, and what th that is. Um, and I think the fact that we actually work in installation and performance on the regular is where that choreography comes in. Sure. Um, cause not that it's bad, but like a big billboard could go up and that would be super simple. It also wouldn't have the humanity that something that where you're activating the glass front and the glass interior and the back wall and knowing that the buses are going by and interrupting all of that. That's all thought of for sure. I guess the reason why I ask that, I think there's a, a short moving image of, I think, Nick is walking, and there are these long yellow strips that have things written on, mm -hmm. and it's almost as if you're almost closing your eyes as you're walking through it, as they're, they're touching you. Um, and I just felt that it almost as if every person that had made a, an entry on mm -hmm. that yellow strip was almost like giving you a love letter, and you were walking and being washed by it. So I was curious, that's why I asked that question, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting when we sort of, you know, th that particular project you're talking about is it, it's called Amends, but th that portion of Amends was in collaboration with the public school 
as well as the community. And so that was the dirty laundry. Uh, and so that was where you could come and write your amends about racism. And leave it in the air. And leave it in the air. Oh, wow. And so that was up on the lawn of the school for about four months. Uh, and imagine it was only one at the beginning, and then by the end of the four months, the entire line was covered with these amends. And so, you know, we do these projects not really knowing the outcome, and that's not really uh, why we do them, but that's the sort of, for me, the most amazing sort of part of it is that you never know what who's going to come and, and participate. Uh, and so, you know, it's all by chance. It's all by, you know, we have to, you know, say something in the moment. And um, again, thinking of ways to inform, thinking of ways of, of how do we unite, how do we sort of collectively uh, become engaged. Uh, it's never for us. And so, you know, when we were doing amends and, you know, it was in response to George Floyd, you know, I said to Bob, I said, you know, I think, you know, we were talking about the project and I said, you know, we have to sort of, you know, talk with uh, our... Uh, our friends? Friends as Let's well as... Start, start the story, like... Um, at the beginning. What? How? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, that, okay. yeah, it's better for when you to you start home. the story. Yeah, right. I could tell it, but it's better for you. Yeah. So I was out of town when George Floyd happened. Actually, I was at my mother's. And, uh, and I was literally, like, just losing it. And she could tell, like, oh, my God, you know, I'm just gonna, she would say this kid, but I'm like, <laughs> but she would say, she could tell that I was like really stressed out about it. And I, and you know, I was just very antsy. And, and I just said, you know, I need to go home because I need to sort of uh, do something about what just happened. And so then I sort of went back uh, home, drove eight hours back home. I get home. Bob and his daughters out uh, at a protest. I'm sort of like just, just sort of struggling with the whole thing uh, and thinking, you know, what can I do uh, in in this sort of moment? He comes home and says, "Oh my God, we were just part of this protest." It wasn't quite this happy. Oh my but God! But it was trying. <laughs> he always tells it a little too happy. Um, uh. <laughs> But it, it was about trying to share that there was an incredible huge amount of humans that were all gathered and walking for like five hours. And we, <laughs> we were happy to be out and trying to be part of something. And so there was a bit of that feeling, but it wasn't quite as happy as you just presented. Okay. And so he came home and, and, and told me that. And I said, well, if you're going to march about it, you have to talk about it. Which was killer and totally right. And so that's where amends and was And so that's born. when amends, that's, that's really. It was essentially about asking, you know, white people to think harder <laughs> and not be so flip. Like I was a little like, oh, I just did something good. You know, just walked in a march. Um, but dig deep. What's your role in it? And we all have a role. And so once you start to go back like that, you start to realize everyone does. And what happens if we invite people to say that? Um, and, and so now tell the first part. And so, <laughs> and so the first part of the project was, you know, I was thinking, you know, we have to say something. And I was thinking, letters to the world. I'm like, well, what does that mean? And so then I said, we have to invite our artist friends. We have to invite curators, uh, civic leaders to come and write on the window a facility, these letters about racism. And so, th you know, we then sort of uh, wrote to 
What? We wrote a very careful letter asking people to come and do that. You guys did that too. I mean, many of you yeah. were, did that here. How many did we send out? Oh, we probably sent out a good, like, 40? Yeah. And so he was, like, I was super stressed out stressed about out it. Because no one was responding. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, give them a minute. I mean, <laughs> this is a big ask. <laughs> and then they all, it, they all came through. And so that was the beginning of sort of, you know, getting sort of creating these sort of letters that were really hard some were really hard but you know truth matters and so th that was sort of the beginning and then we wanted to open that up to where it was to the broader community and then that's where the d uh, dirty laundry piece came with uh, across the street right. Did I do okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> that was good. So, um, yeah, we're, we're good on time. So, I always like to explore realms and spaces that maybe they haven't shared. I think this is the first time they're talking about facility, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, one of the things I, I asked them was um, a song. And it was, if there was a song that is a soundtrack for them or facility, what would that be? That's the first thing. The second thing is, um, if I have the, the capacity, a magic wand, to raise a person from a past life and have them on the stage here and they could have a conversation with, who would that person be? And final thing would be if there was an object. If there was an object that they could take with them as I take them away to London for one year, all your bills are paid, you can only take this one object with you and come as you are, what would one of those three things be? So I'm just kind of curious, just to put that out there. The song, the object, this. and the person. <laughs> oh my God. The, the, the song would be Here's to Life. I knew he was going to say that. <laughs> it would be Here, Here's to Life, Shirley Horn. Really? Wow. For sure. And why, like, why that like song? I, you know, I play it every day have for like 40 years, like that album. But, you know, right now I'm listening to Doja Cat. So. <laughs> I think um, my daughter is as well. My daughter over there is there. <laughs> But, and the person that I would uh, have to be with would be Janet Jackson. Oh, Janet Jackson. I don't know. Yeah. I knew that too. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I have to confess it would be. Uh, object. Probably needlepoint. Needlepoint. Okay. Because that's what's happening in the studio right now. <laughs> so... Okay, Bob. That's so funny. <laughs> um, so I guess music's hard, but I thought about that for a second, and I would be going to, like, I have a playlist that's just called Summer Happy, and it's all the stuff that just, if I want to go for a run, that just is, like, fun to get the funk out. And it, it's, it's everybody from... Um, uh, it's everybody from like Harry Styles to like Megan Thee Stallion to um, it's all of it, you know, and it, it would be that. Um, and then the person, the person, it wouldn't be to put them on stage here with us. Um, the person would be my mom and it would be at a table, a kitchen table, mm -hmm. there'd be food at it. And it would be um, with no one else around. That's what I want. Object? Good bowl of pasta. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> Very sensorial. <laughs> so, what we—I mean, again, um, facility. What is a joy and what is a pain about facility? I think, uh, I mean, it's all a joy, completely. A pain. I need more space. Yeah. How much more? Like twice as much. <laughs> <laughs> like for real. For real. <laughs> uh, the the joy is when 
one of these um, people who just got a got to show with us comes says later the next year, oh, this got me to this other thing. Yeah, that's the joy. Like that's super exciting when they get a commission or they get a project or um, they just it inspires them to do the next thing. That's amazing. Um, what's the pain? Pain is that there's not enough yeah. time. So you're gonna say not enough space, but yeah. there's not enough time. Like it's not programmed because we do it. And so it's programmed by the capacity we have at that time. And so like it could do more, but then that would be another person. And then I don't think it would be the same place. Okay, yeah. Where do you see the, the future in facility in terms of its purpose? its function and um, its contribution to design. Art and design. Yeah. Art and design. What was yeah. your question? So where do you, how would you uh, describe the future of facility and its yeah. impact and contribution to yeah, art and design? Yeah, I think, you know, we'll, uh, I think more scholarships, uh, I think that really is sort of the goal. Um, yeah, we finally got our 501c3, just like yeah. in December. So that's a big change. And I think, you know, it'll just keep uh, serving as it does. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hope that it's a it's a weird space and like I said it, what makes it special is because it is unprogrammed and it is anything that it needs to be like it's been it's been a a little market you know not unlike a craft fair you might go to except curated with like really amazing artisans that call themselves artists and they really are and they just don't get their work out and sold and to be able to put it in that space and invite the the folks that follow him to see their work that's a really special thing so it's it's design and it's art and it's um events and it's it's everywhere and i'd love other spaces to be doing the the same kind of thing without without having to have measurements backwards like metrics that say we're successful because we did x I really love the idea that you can be successful without having to put it on paper with a number next to it. And it could just be, oh, somebody had a really great experience or a really amazing feeling. I wish that could be something that other places take. I mean, and what kind of advice do you give to young artists or, or graduates or a young Nick Cave or a young Bob Force? What would, kind of advice? They're sitting right there, 21 years old. What would you say to them? Oh my God! It doesn't uh, have to be clean. You know, I would just, I would, <laughs> I would just say, keep doing what you're doing. I mean, and sort of just fall into the abyss of it all. You'll land somewhere. I mean, you know, I did. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I've learned lots from him, and it's all, it's always about like facing fear or, or something like that. It's stepping into the fear. It's always about that. Um, because it's the fear, fear, fear that averages everything, right? So it is about like jumping into the fire and if the f fire burns the edge, that's what it's supposed to be. And you know, and fear is not real, so. It's not. Wow. You laugh, but it's not. <laughs> it's just a feeling that you've associated to something you think might happen. Yeah. It's not real. I think that's deep. My therapist told me that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think we have about uh, 10 minutes. And I know some of you are burning to ask a question. Um, so I think we'll open it up. And you know, you can state your name and just ask a question. Oh, we've got, oh, we've got, they're coming. <laughs> They're coming. I just want. Hello. I just wondered if you have a special relationship with Dr. Stuart Bonte and you. Yes, ish. Um, <laughs> we we talked with them on the regular, 
and we try to do things on the regular and we do the things that we can. Um, ever since COVID, it's been really hard to make, make things happen. And so we have lots of I ideas, but we work with them like um, anything that we can do and bring to the school, they, they want us to do and we do things that way. But I think there needs to be a, some more um, literal exchanges. Like I wanna find ways that their kids could get work in our space or on our walls somehow too. And that just hasn't happened yet and it's going to. Very easy with the grade schools, but the high schools, it's, it's hard. There's a, they have not enough capacity to make special things happen and uh, they want to. So it will eventually. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I mean, the what's really great is that we do our work entirely differently, but we do have similar aesthetics and we definitely both are like super hard workers that want to um, make super effective things. And so I'm totally happy working with and for and on his work as I am working on my work. So that's really, from my perspective, I love that. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, you know, we both have our work mm -hmm. and then we come together and, and we do these amazing things together. But, you know, I think we have to be independent um, because that's that's why we're together. Yeah. yeah. Any others? Okay, we got one here. Yeah, so there are those people that make um, studio assistants that help make the work that's in the museums and galleries that gets sold. They don't really do any of that stuff. Right. Those are invitations. And the other thing that um, is different about facility is the invitations, uh, they come with a real openness because like I said, we don't have huge capacity, so we have a lot of trust. And so the artists that put work in there, we're there to answer any questions and help them however they want, but they also could do whatever they want. So we don't know exactly what's gonna show up. And when it shows up, we help present it the best it can, but also try to not have a heavy hand. So that's a lot of it, is handing over trust, right? Um, and then the other thing is, um, this work happens while we eat, this work happens while we sleep, this work happens before people get there. Um, we said it earlier, when you love what you do, you can do a <coughs> lot, which is really great. I do think that there's a ceiling that is coming very soon that's gonna be hard to do more, right? Um, because there's, the asks are incredible right now, they're over the top. Ever since the Guggenheim, um, the requests are, they're wonderful, but they're a lot. And so you don't wanna pass on them, but you wonder how. But I think these projects here, again, it's, you know, we're not mentoring anyone. It's really cage blanc. So when we invite you to do a project, 
for inviting you to do a project. Uh, I really do not have, I don't even sort of step into the space uh, while they're installing. I don't really want to have, I don't, I, I can't get involved. Uh, and I think it's about, again, you know, you know, what do you do in, with, in, with this sort of opportunity and how do you step up to that? Um, and so allowing that to happen and allowing one to work through that, the fear of that and, and, um, and accepting what, what they've done as well. Go one in the front. So you may have to just project. Yeah, so um, <laughs> a lot of your guys' work is very like public and um, your your um, both artists seem to be like, you know, fostering up um, the communal spaces and public um, works of art. Have like do you think art for you, like throughout your careers, have has always been like something you desire to make communal or as a collective action? Or <coughs> Two different, two different answers. You want to go? You go. Okay. Um, so the majority of my career, 30 years, was as a designer in a very commercial kind of way. So I've always had um, clients and objectives to hit. And so in a way, that has always been about public facing something. Um, so I'm super comfortable in that space. And as I transitioned into the art world, primarily through his practice, that's where my practice became my own thing because I can um, use all the strategies that I know as a designer um, to work with communities and groups and kind of build um, a safe table where things can be discussed and we can do really cool things um, and then put it out in a way that's the art part is putting it out in a way that's not telling someone. I used to do design work the same work but I was telling people what you're supposed to think in the end and now we come up with the project and we put it out there so that people can absorb whatever they're supposed to absorb based on the subject we're trying to put out. So it's very, I, I use the design world very much in my artwork now. Yeah, and I think I've always uh, sort of been sort of uh, in the public sort of space. Uh, you know, the work in the studio is built there, but it serves in the, pu in the public, so. And then, you know, the real work that matters to me is really this sort of collaboration when I'm working within communities and, and um, yeah. Yeah, there's never an exhibition that he does at a museum that doesn't have a major, it's a not necessarily has to be called outreach, but a major external component, whether it's a performance with a lot of outreach in it, um, but there's always that part. And if there isn't that in the ask, he asks for that, so that it always has that. Wow. We've got time for maybe one more. There's one in the center or one at the back. You guys can pick center or back. Oh, we got it. Pardon. Where are all your sound suits? Is anybody uh, dancing with them? Uh, there's. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know where they're at. <laughs> well, they're you know, they're in museums and in you know private collections, but they're 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 out there somewhere. Thank you. <laughs> and we last one at the back, I think. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the process of growing up as an artist and how you go from working on your project um, and then starting having immigrants to now working with an much more uh, larger scale? You know, I think that, um, you know, I think it just, I think it, you know, it's, it's each project, I think you scale up. Uh, regardless what the size of the project is, uh, you scale up uh, because your work is developing. Uh, you scale up because you know you may you know the space that you're presenting is in is a little bit bigger. Uh, but I think it's all sort of internal. Like for me, it was you know after every exhibition, you know it's it's you know it's always that question: what's next? So that is scaling up. 
Uh, and so it's really about just sort of allowing sort of uh, that to sort of be part of your sort of presence. You know, I don't think about, I think more about what's happening in the studio and less about where it's going to be presented at. Uh, because I think that one takes care of the other. So it's really sort of allowing, you know, oneself to just remain very wide open. But it's really about the studio work and really sort of, you know, how do I continue to sort of evolve and, and sort of expand? I think you should answer that question. Yeah, how do you scale up? <laughs> I think we're out of time, though. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Um, I guess I, the scaling up comes through kind of purpose and intention. So I'm always curious about the type of um, immersive experience I want my audience to have. So when I think about when I created the Garden of Eden that was here, that was one of the first pieces I made that was purely, didn't have any representation in it, but was purely immersive. And the, the responsibility was on the subject. So when I designed that with David Ajay, he said, the gallery attendant must speak to the audience to say, they look in their face and they say, your eyes are blue, can you go right? Your eyes are brown, can you go left? And they say, why? And they said, the artist said so. So having that kind of conversation, that immersive experience was crucial. And then when, when I think about the, the Masonic pieces that I did, I mean, they're larger than life. They're probably like, you know, nine or 10 feet in height, was to really see them as monuments and to see the importance of a so-called black intelligentsia and tell a completely different story about black excellence and, and achievement and, you know, and um, support. So for me, it's, it's really kind of based around the, the kind of um, engagement I want my audience to have with the work. And some things are really small. Some things are really, really tiny that they have to be up so close that they can almost feel the breath of the work. Thank you. Well. I want to thank Nick Cave and Bob Forst and Lamoka for this wonderful discussion. Thank you all for taking time to be here today. I think facility is definitely groundbreaking. It's in the Midwest. Um, I can see it has a wonderful heartbeat and a pulse that will continue to grow. And we're going to hope that you'll be able to get more space. And thank you for, <laughs> you know, and I seriously do mean that. And thank you for creating magic, wonder, and, um, and allowing that community to have their voice and nurturing the young next generation. So thank you. Thank you.